Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Can we afford health care for all? That was the question posed at a recent health care conference in Corvallis, Oregon in April of this year. Dr. Marsha Angel, who is a past editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, was there to answer the question. I'm going to be talking about health care reform, what's happening in Washington, how it's likely to turn out, and how I think it should turn out. Before I can talk about it, uh, I have to spend some time describing the current system because it doesn't make any sense to try to evaluate the reform of a system unless you know why it needs reform. So I'm going to be talking with you about the current dysfunctional system and that, that takes a lot of courage because usually people's eyes glaze over if you say I'm going to talk with you about the healthcare system. Uh, and, uh, and, and people are taught that it's extraordinarily complicated. Uh, I think that people are almost deliberately led to believe it's more complicated than it is by the private health insurance industry because if you can convince the pe people that something is terribly complicated, uh, then they won't be so willing to risk changing it. Uh, and so even though most people believe it needs changing, understand very well that it's not working, uh, they don't have the courage of their own feelings because they are led to believe by policymakers who get a lot of their campaign contributions and a lot of their income from the private insurance industry that it is just impossible to fully grasp and so they should just shut up and then take it as it is. So I'll begin by briefly describing three features of our health system that distinguish it from every other health system in advanced countries. First, our system is uniquely expensive and uniquely inflationary. Last year we spent about two and a half trillion dollars, that's trillion with a T, on health care or well over eight thousand dollars per person in the country. And costs keep growing at two to three times the background inflation rate. What about comparably wealthy countries? Well, if we look at the 30 members of the OECD, and that's the club of, of rich nations, we find a startling disparity. In the most recent year for which figures are available, we spent two and a half times as much per person on health care as the average for all the OECD countries, adjusted for cost of living differences, two and a half times as much. The other countries clustered fairly close together. Some of them are very low costs, like Great Britain. Some are higher, like Switzerland and Norway. But still, they do cluster fairly close together while we stood clearly apart. We were the outlier, and that gap is growing year after year. So clearly our health system is uniquely expensive and unsustainable. Second, the second feature, we don't get anywhere near our money's worth. By all the usual method, measures of health care, life expectancy, infant mortality, immunization rates, and most importantly perhaps preventable mortality, we rank near the bottom of the OECD countries. Furthermore, contrary to conventional wisdom, we don't provide more basic services. On average, we have fewer hospital beds and fewer doctors and fewer nurses per capita. We see our doctors less often and we have shorter hospital stays. So these figures give the lie to the notion that, yeah, Americans do have an expensive system, but that's because we want everything. That isn't the truth. We get very little. Canadians, for example, see their doctors nearly twice as often as we do. Worst of all, we're the only nation that doesn't provide comprehensive health care to all its citizens. Some 50 million Americans are uninsured, disproportionately the sick, 
the poor and minorities. And most of the rest of us, whether you know it or not, are underinsured in the sense that we're not covered for every contingency. Our healthcare system then is outrageously expensive, yet inadequate and inequitable. Why? How can we explain the paradox of spending more and getting less? Well, the only plausible explanation is that there's something about the system itself, about the way we finance and deliver health care that's enormously inefficient. That's the only plausible explanation. And here's a clue. The third distinguishing feature of the American health system is that it's the only market-based system among the OECD countries. In fact, it's not a system at all, but a hodgepodge of different commercial arrangements that exist more or less independently from one another. The other countries all have national health systems. Some are single-payer systems, which means that all health care funds, whatever their source, are funneled through a single public agency, which then coordinates the distribution of the resources. Some have multiple payers, like Switzerland and the Netherlands, but the system is tightly regulated so that everyone is covered and prices and benefits are uniform and the insurers are nonprofit. So, to recap the three distinguishing features, uniquely expensive, uniquely inadequate, and a market-based system. I believe the underlying problem with the system is precisely our reliance on a commercial market in healthcare. Most of the other problems in the system flow from that one. Alone among advanced countries, we treat healthcare like a market commodity instead of a social service. Thus, we distribute it not according to medical need, but according to the ability to pay. But there's a great mismatch between medical need and the ability to pay. In fact, those with the greatest need are precisely those least able to pay. So while markets are good for many things, they're not a good way to distribute health care. People who are well insured may get an MRI they don't need. They may get many MRIs they don't need while people without insurance may not get an MRI that they do need. The, the characteristic of the system of uh, providing all kinds of tests and procedures to well-insured people or wealthy people um, and, and billing uh, for those tests and procedures exorbitantly um, it reminds me uh, of a joke about um, a, a woman who had a pet duck and her duck wasn't doing so well. So she brought the duck into the veterinarian's office, limp duck, uh, very upset. And she said to the vet, you know, something's really wrong with my duck. Take a look at my duck. And so he put the duck on the examining table and he looked at the duck and he said, Madam, he said, your duck is dead. And she said, oh no, it, it, maybe he's in a coma or something. Maybe you could do something. And he looked again at the duck and he said, no, I'm quite sure your duck is dead. Uh, you could have a second opinion if you want one. <laughs> and so she said, well, yeah, I think I'd like that. Uh, and so he said, okay. So he opened the door to a side room and in came a Labrador retriever. <laughs> and the retriever bounded up to the examining table and stood on his hind legs and put his paws on the table and kind of walked on his legs around the table, sniffing at the duck, and then sat back on his haunches and looked up at the vet and shook his head sadly. <laughs> uh, so he went into the room and out of the side room came a cat. And the cat leapt up on the table, and the cat walked all around the duck, sniffed at the duck, sat back on his haunches, looked up at the vet, sadly shook his head. So the vet said, no, your duck is dead. 
so she pulled herself together and she said, well, how much do I owe you? And he said, that'll be $200. And he, he, she said, $200 just to tell me that my duck is dead? And uh, he said, well, no, that part cost you $20. He said, but you throw in the lab test and the CAT scan and it really mounts <laughs> up. So that's what we have in our system. <clears throat> Furthermore, successful markets expand. They don't contract. That's Economics 101. All businesses aim to increase revenues and maximize profits. That's what they do. Hospitals in the US, for example, often advertise their services. Come and get a total body MRI scan uh, for your wife for Christmas, the best gift you could give her. You know, it's this kind of stuff that the hospitals do. Uh, like all businesses, they want more, not fewer customers. So each element in the health market is working to grow, even while the country as a whole presumably wants the system to contract. So even on the face of it, in its own terms, it makes no sense to have a market-based system when you want it to contract. Let's look more closely about how the healthcare market works. Most Americans receive tax-exempt health benefits from their employers who pay insurers a portion of the insurance premiums, these days a smaller and smaller portion, but not all employers offer benefits. It's strictly voluntary, and when they do, the benefits may not be comprehensive. Increasingly, then, employers cap their contributions so that the burden of increasing costs falls entirely on workers, and workers in turn often turn down benefits even when they're offered because they can't afford their growing share. The insurers with whom employers contract are mostly investor-owned for-profit businesses. They try to compete to get employers' business while maximizing profits at the same time by stinting on medical services. In fact, the best way for insurers to compete is by not insuring high-risk patients at all, by limiting the coverage of those they do insure, for example, by excluding expensive services like bone marrow transplantation, and by co passing costs back to patients as deductibles and co-payments and claim denials. We are the only nation in the world with a health care system based on dodging sick people. That's what all of this is about. These practices add enormously to overhead costs because they require a great deal of paperwork. They also require creative marketing to attract the affluent and healthy and avoid the poor and the sick. Not surprisingly, then, the US has by far the highest overhead costs in the world and overhead is one of the fastest growing components of our system. So now let's follow the healthcare dollar as it wends its way from employers toward the doctors and nurses and hospitals that actually provide the medical services. First, private insurers regularly skim off the top of the premium dollar a substantial fraction of the premiums, around 20% for their administrative costs, marketing, and profits. The remainder, the 80 cents, is then passed along a veritable gauntlet of satellite businesses that have sprung up around the health industry because there's so much money in it. These include brokers to cut deals, disease management and utilization review companies, drug management companies, legal services, marketing consultants, billing agencies, information management firms, and so on and so on and so on. They too siphon off some of the premiums, including enough for their own administrative costs, marketing, and profits. Probably no more than 70 cents of the healthcare dollar, and that's generous, uh, 70 cents of the healthcare dollar actually reaches the providers 
who themselves have high overhead costs to deal with the requirements of multiple insurers often bent on avoiding payment. Cutting overhead in half would save the system several hundred billion dollars a year. And we can disagree about that amount. Uh, at least $200 billion a year, more than enough to cover all of the uninsured. In the past, there have been attempts to reform the system incrementally. Mainly these have been efforts to counteract the harshest effects of the market by subsidizing care to people who would otherwise go without and discouraging demand by stratagems such as managed care. But all attempts to reform the system piecemeal have run into the following dilemma. If we expand coverage, then costs inevitably rise. And if costs are lowered, then coverage is inevitably reduced. Think about that. If the system stays essentially as it is and we just tinker around the edges, coverage and costs have to move in the same direction. The only way both to increase health coverage and reduce costs is to change the system entirely. If you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope you'll remember this one point. Coverage and costs cannot move in different directions if the system stays the same. With that as background, what can we say about President Obama's health care plan, the Affordable Care Act, which was passed two years ago? Well, first, let's look at the substance. Obama's stated purpose was to control costs so that we could expand coverage. After all, if it weren't for costs, coverage would be a piece of cake. Right? Didn't care how much it cost, you could cover everybody easily for everything. Yet from the beginning, the president made it clear that the private insurance industry would continue to be the linchpin of our system. Moreover, not only would it remain the linchpin, but he would deliver to insurance companies millions more customers, billions more dollars, and those customers would be required to purchase policies at whatever price the companies charge. And he would take about a half a trillion dollars of public money to subsidize those purchases. This is a recipe for price inflation. There is nothing in the plan that would control costs. Yes, some of the worst abuses of the insurance companies would be curbed, such as excluding people with pre-existing conditions. But companies could respond by simply raising their prices. There is nothing in the plan that would stop the overuse of tests and procedures, as in the CAT scan and the Labrador Retriever. Providers would still be paid to do more of them uh, on a piecework basis. Without measures to curb the rise in premiums and the overuse of expensive care, there would be no control, there will be no control of costs. Well, you might say, what about the fact that the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, was, has projected that the plan would actually save money over 10 years compared with doing nothing? That's true, but you have to remember that the CBO looks only at costs to the federal government, nothing else. It doesn't look at the health system as a whole. Looked at that way, the plan might cut the federal budget, but only by moving money out of Medicare into the private sector and Medicaid. The CBO's projections don't include any consideration of inflation in the private sector. In my view, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, will never be fully implemented as written. If the Supreme Court declares it unconstitutional, or there's a Republican sweep in November, that will be the end of it. But if, as I suspect, it is not declared unconstitutional, and as I hope, President Obama is reelected with the Democratic Senate, at least, I think the ACA is doomed anyway. It will gradually unravel. 
Costs will rise even faster than before the law was passed because it is so inflationary. There will be multiple legal challenges to the requirement that states set up insurance exchanges. And the bureaucratic challenges of monitoring insurance companies will be overwhelming. Just as an example, one of the provisions in the law is that uh, insurance companies cannot uh, spend uh, less than 80% on health care, on medical services. They can keep a maximum of 20% uh, in, in profits and overhead. That's in the law. Uh, now, what they spend on medical services, they call their medical loss ratio, and that language is very telling. Uh, they want to keep that as low as possible. Uh, they want to keep the executive salaries and the profits as high as possible. And when they advertise to investors, they boast about having a low medical loss ratio. They, th this is an attractive feature to investors. Well, suddenly now, with the ACA, if it goes into effect, uh, and in this regard it is, uh, it's no longer to their advantage to say that they have a low medical loss ratio. They must keep that ratio at 80%. So what they will do, uh, and what some of them are beginning to do, is simply redefine what's medical care and what's overhead. So they say, well, yeah, some of what we have called marketing is really connected with medical services, so that's really in that 80%. Uh, the, the law has provisions to stop some of the abuses of the insurance companies, but particularly physicians realize that almost all of these regulations can be circumvented in one way or another, and to try to stop it when, when you have a financial incentives, incentive to provide fewer services, which they certainly do, to try to stop them from, from following that incentive by regulations, first of all, is impossible. Uh, and second of all, it would require a, a huge bureaucracy that would gobble up a lot of, of the healthcare dollar. The only way to sustain an inherently inflationary system is to reduce benefits or increase deductibles and co-payments or both. That's the only way they could stagger along with this. The result is that people may end up with insurance that's inadequate because the benefit package has, has shrunk uh, or is too expensive to actually use because of high deductibles and co-payments. Health insurance is not the same thing as health care. We often use those terms interchangeably, but they're not the same, uh, not by a long shot. And that's probably the second point I would most want you to remember from this talk, that insurance is not the same thing as care. People can have insurance that's of little use to them when they're sick, and remember that. Uh, I believe the only answer is a national system like every other advanced country has. Uh, we need to get everyone under the same tent so we don't have this shell game in which we shift costs from one part of the system to another. This would be tantamount to extending Medicare to the entire population. We've been listening to Dr. Marsha Angel, past editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, answering the question, can we afford single-payer health care for all? We hope that you've enjoyed this program and that you'll tune in for part two when we will hear her husband answering the same question. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.